who has the who who think he has the largest uh, amount of followers on Twitter? Raise your hand. How many you have? How many? Eighty thousand. Okay. Who is uh, who also has? Uh, in this order of magnitude. Dr. Dr. Ruth. Ruth yeah. Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth and Dana Rielli, can you please come to the podium? <laughs> can I get another microphone? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to present to you Dr. Ruth and Dana Rielli, two of the world's best entertain entertainers. <laughs> Okay, first of all... No, well, we didn't give you the right to speak. <laughs> okay, we will start with the ladies. All right. How first do you all, tweet? First of all, let me say one thing for Richard. That uh, I like what you say, because I want people to go to the movies and hold hands. I don't want to see any... Not you, I'll go over there. <laughs> so... Uh, what I, t I want to tell you what worries me. Um, what worries me is that I see two people walking down the streets and holding hands, and each one tweets with somebody else. <laughs> the other thing that worries me is your use of the word friend. The word friend, Javier, has to be earned. And by you saying, friends, everybody, I have 76,000 people on Twitter. I don't do the Twitter myself. I call Pierre, I tell them that I got kissed by the president of Israel, that I'm not washing my face for a week <laughs> by the president of um, the United States, Clinton, on the other cheek. So there is something that can be transmitted in terms of information and fun. But what worries me on a serious note is that young people do not realize that whatever they put on their computer, gossip or pictures cannot be retrieved. They think that they can call it back and they can't call it back. And all of you know about the young student from Rutgers University uh, it wasn't the only problem, but he did commit suicide because somebody filmed him. So we have to be a little bit more cautious. What I'm happy is that uh, you employ so many people. I want people to have jobs. In terms of relationships, I would want to have a talk about the, the importance of that relationship before you go into it. Israel Maimon, write it as a topic for next year conference. <laughs> Dr. Ruth, how many followers do you have on Twitter? 76,706. Thank you. Aren't, aren't you. Aren't you ashamed that this young guy has 4,000 more, more followers than you? Again. Aren't you embarrassed that he has 4,000 more followers uh, than you? No, because I'm very careful what I put on Twitter. Uh -huh. I am very careful that I say what's happening and some of the warning about US, your media. We are going to help you, you see, because we have a, a live broadcast and we have here over 1,000 people in the crowd. Anybody who wants to follow Dr. Ruth and who is not follower as, as of now, what is your... Uh... Ask Dr. Ruth. Ask Dr. Ruth. <laughs> okay, so you will get another 4,000. Dan. <laughs> Dan Ariely, Professor Dan Ariely. Uh, I'm sure that many of you read these books. Should I say that anybody who read your book sh sh no. should stay sitting? Yeah, I don't want to be embarrassed. No. You don't want to be embarrassed? No, you have... Uh, what, how many copies have been sold of your books? Uh, at least three. Three copies, <laughs> that's good. How do you use Twitter, Dan? Uh, I, I mostly use it for uh, research. So I mostly send out uh, research ideas uh, on both uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn. I had one interesting experience. My sister told me that I was not sharing enough personal stuff. Uh, I'm just sharing kind of professional stuff. So one night I had a very tough night. I had lots of pain. So the next morning I wrote that I had lots of pain. And I was wondering whether people could like it on Facebook. How do you like misery? Um, 
And indeed, I got a few likes, but I got lots of comments, which, which, which is interesting. And you think about the, the way that the engineering of the social media influences what we're willing to share and not share. Because just by the fact you have a like button and not a, a I hear you, I feel your pain, and so on, you're basically influencing what people are uh, willing to share. I, I do want to say two things uh, related to what Dr. Ruth was saying. One is that um, I, I do think there's a question about friendship. And we did a study in which we asked people, uh, how many of your friends on Facebook would you be willing to bail out of prison? Uh, and the answer is not that many. And, you know, if you think about the uh, act of having coffee with somebody and the reciprocity that comes with it, it's a very different story than uh, creating a connection. I think. We know superficial things about people, um, sometimes even deep things, but the question of what is our uh, relationship and how much do we feel connected to them and how much would we go out of our way to help them is incredibly um, limited. That's on the negative side. On the positive side, um, I, taught, I just finished teaching class on Coursera. Uh, Daphne was here yesterday, she gave a, a talk. And I have to say this was an incredible experience. So we started with about 170,000 students who came to this class online. And can, you, can you just say one sentence, what is Coursera for the Coursera people? is an online free educational platform. Uh, everybody is doing it for free. Uh, Coursera at some point I hope will make some money, but right now they're just losing. Um, and uh, investing, I guess. And uh, we create lots of videos and people have uh, questions and quizzes and so on. But what was amazing about this was the creation of a community. I had students from south of Sudan uh, not that many, but we had some, in 190 countries, people were just getting together and um, in, in these discussions form, talking to each other and connecting. And, and this was for me an unbelievable experience. I felt that we created this community for a few weeks from all over the world, people interested in this particular topic, that this was really a, a great triumph of social media and the internet. <clears throat> and really the idea that people from all over the world can talk about science and change uh, opinions was just incredible. Thank you. Dr. Root, you want to add anything? Maybe later. Thank you, Dr. Root and Dana Rielli. <laughs> unfortunately, yes, unfortunately, we have to bring this session very much to the close. So one last statement to each of our distinguished members. Maurice, since you are, look, the most distinguished one, we will start with you. I'm not the most distinguished. I think that uh, my friends on the I panel... I said you are not the most. I said ah, you okay. look the most. You know, <laughs> I, I agree with that. I fully agree with that. Uh, now, I wanted to pick on what has been said uh, just now, which is uh, regarding the friends at Facebook. And uh, we did a campaign which was extremely interesting, and we got a lot of reaction. We wanted to test if... Um, a friend is a friend. And we, uh, for Nescafe, we, we picked uh, one guy in France uh, and as a test market, and we asked him to go to these uh, 102,068 friends that he had and to share a cup of coffee. And he was knocking at the door, I'm your Facebook friend, and the, we, ha we have seen, the, and he was filming all this with the camera which was there and he, 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 on his chest, and it was quite interesting because we said, wow, fantastic, you are Arno, yes, I'm a, and the other one was, boom, uh, cl <laughs> closing the door on his face and saying, uh, yeah, it, it was a mistake to be your friend. <laughs> and we, ha we have seen a lot of these things, and this is just incredible because we wanted to test if a friend is a friend. And what I can tell you, is that in Israel, a friend is a friend. This was a very nice statement. Rich, your last words. Thank you. Your famous last words. No, no, no the last, uh, today. Today's last words, OK. Um, uh, two very brief things. One, I was at a seminar um, on a panel with Mark Zuckerberg and also Michael Winton, who runs Sony. Was Not the, everybody knows who is Mark Zuckerberg. Can the, you the, fa the founder of Facebook, a friend. Um, and David Stern, the commissioner of the National Basketball Association. Howard Stern? No, uh, his cousin, David. And, um, and the head of Sony and all these people. And the, the test was to develop a business concept. 
come up with the perfect business concept, and this was five years ago, and everyone in the room said that they wanted to invent something like Facebook, of course, because this was the hottest thing. Um, except Mark Zuckerberg said, he said, what I've invented is a distribution platform, and distribution platforms always change. He said, you look at the structure of studios, there have been the same studios for the last 100 years. So he said, you know, maybe you shouldn't uh, focus so much only on distribution, maybe content matters. So, and, and then the final thing I'll leave you with is, I would, I would definitely bail Yossi Vardy out of jail. <laughs> He's a real friend, what can I tell you? Tim, last statement. You know, I will uh, not talk about the internet, but talk about something that I think is uh, really needed in the world, and that's uh, risk-taking and, and leadership. And I think uh, starting with the president here, and he has a long, incredible history of risk-taking and leadership. I think uh, Maurice's risk-taking and leadership has navigated Publicis to be an incredibly large company that's, uh, that's digital. And um, what I see in Israel that I'm really excited about is uh, the energy level. And I think as the world goes from countries to communities, uh, there's probably nothing more important than uh, a group of people taking really, really big risks to try big things. And I hope that uh, social and mobile and all those things, uh, I hope people shut their phones off uh, at least one day a week and think about really big ideas because I've seen the power of that with our Israeli team and, the, and they've really helped change a company that probably would have gone out of business. And uh, I think Israel is a very promising thing for big thoughts and big dreams and I hope you guys will keep going. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Armstrong, Maurice Levy and Rich Gelfon, thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure and the honor to present to you our next four victims. <laughs> René Obermann, the CEO of Deutsche Telekom. René, please. <laughs> Weili Dai, the founder of Marvel, and my Chinese sister. Mark Benioff, the founder and the CEO of Salesforce.com and Robert Lecascio, the founder, the CEO, and the chairman of Life Person, please. Good. The, the common, one of the common things, one of the common things to these four distinguished speakers, all of them have operations in Israel, and we will use it as we do every year a little bit to do a little bit of shameless Zionist propaganda and uh, you will have to cooperate with it. You will have to exhibit uh, enthusiasm, either genuine or faked one. But uh, <laughs> Whaley, why don't we start with you? First of all, do you want to say something to the audience? Shalom. Pokotov and poco yafe. And how, how things, Weili? How things now? Sababa. Uh, <laughs> and this is my ahi just, just yossi. Well, first of all, uh, you see me, I'm very touched because we have such a special person in the audience, uh, of our president, Paris. Um, Moza Tov to President Paris. And he is indeed, all of us in the world, he is Gibo. It means hero. Okay. He is our, indeed, and, and his passion, and I always tell people, his passion and compassion for people in. Israel and in the world, this is second to none. And we really honor him and his dedication. I mean, I, you know, I always tell people, I think he's, even though we're here, my husband and I uh, flew in to celebrate his 90th birthday and I have such opportunity to share some thoughts with all of you. But, uh, you know, I want to, all of us to celebrate, I call the Mozartov to President Paris. 
Your husband is your also co-founder, right? The two of you created Marvel. Yes, absolutely. Can you please stand up and we can applaud you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I, I got to say, um, I'm a Chinese mother and wife, but I know I'm very similar to the Israeli uh, mother and wife, and you know what I mean, right? <laughs> we, are, we have our duty, and we're the giver and caretaker for our family and all the friends and neighbors. And we always offer food, right? Have you noticed? <laughs> Are you hungry? You know. But anyway, well, it is such an honor for me to uh, share my thoughts with you today. I, I got to tell you, uh, Israel is such a beautiful country. I call Eretz Yaffa. Uh, Weili, can you tell us a little bit about Marvel in general, your activities in Israel? And uh, you shared with me a few months ago your vision for the future, what Marvel is now uh, focusing and concentrating on. Well, Toda you see. Um, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm a geek. You probably can tell. Um, Marvel is a world-leading uh, semiconductor company in the world. We have over 7,000 employees around the world. In Israel, we have about 20% of our company population, um, which I'm very proud, over 1,200 people in Israel. And Anybody from, our, from our veil on the, uh, in the crowd, stand up. You have any? Oh, good. Come on. And um, I got the, we started operation here uh, in 2001. Um, the first acquisition I did was Galileo and then Redland, and also Intel division in PTK. So if you look at the talent here, it is phenomenal. And um, today we operate in a world of new era of digital lifestyle. What does that mean? That means technology is embedded in part of our lifestyle and we are seamlessly connected. Everywhere we go, we're always connected and we're always on consumers, which means the technology not only have to work from the each region, each country, and needs to be working globally and seamlessly. So globalization is a key. Any countries, any companies need to be successful, get ahead of game. Uh, globalization is very, very important. Now, at the same time, we also understand the local, localization, the old way of localization for countries, for regions. So I use a term called optimization for localization, but has to be globally uh, sound. So this is a very, very important uh, strategy moving forward. Now, of course, you heard that the brothers on the previous panel and think about them, they are the content players. And they are the, I call them the toppings. Well, let me explain now. What do I mean by toppings? Well, you heard me, um, I'm a semiconductor company, right? Think about product as pizza. I want to explain something. I'm a mother, right? You need to explain something that really easy to understand. So we are the toppings, the semiconductor company. The tomato sauce are the different operating systems such as Google, Microsoft, Apple of the world, Blackberry, Linux, and so on. Toppings are the applications, are the contents. So now you understand, right? So the world is seamlessly connected. The other analogy I use is a seamlessly connected pipes, right? So the content providers like the Tim and Richard, the, the big TV, and my friend Morris, and think about today, how do we manage the contents that seamlessly and very fast? And this is what we do. We, as a semiconductor company, uh, in fact, I'm very proud that technology and the key technology is developed in Israel. Uh, the infrastructure, the networking, high performance, as well as the mobile. Now, speaking of mobile, the LTE, very important. I would encourage that uh, LTE is going to be the fast pipe seamlessly connected around the world. So I hope that uh, 
uh, in the beautiful country Israel will also uh, deploy uh, technology uh, upgrade 3G to LTE. Okay. Um, so we actually we have a great team here developing LTE technology. So now let me continue the contents and live contents video are going to be part of a key con uh, data and contents for us, live contents. So out of the each pipe, this is what we see different type of size pizza dough. The smaller size, like the smartphone, and then tablets, and the big screen TVs. So this is how we're going to operate. Each of us, technology is embedded, follow us around. And this is also important that we also understand the behavior of the, our each human being. And the automation of depends on each person. We all have a profile, think about this. And then the technologies around us, it'll tracking us how we behave, what, is, what are the preference, where we like to go, how we operate our daily life, how am I doing my cooking, and what kind of places I like to go shop. So all these becoming assist. I got the real-time technology assist. So security is very key because, you know, you don't want to open everything about your life to the world. So this the security technology to me is another future uh, very hot topic. And I am very happy to tell you that uh, Israel is the leader in terms of uh, security technology. Thank you. You know what is, your last name is Dai. You know what is in Hebrew, Dai? It means Yossi is enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yofi, right, Yofi? Okay, thank you for the time being. We'll come back to you, Renee. Let's speak where Whaley ends, and this is about uh, security. Last week, you got really some of the top uh, brains of the industry in your uh, in your, uh, you host them and uh, you got, you, you have your own idea, you got the best ideas of the industry, where the mobile and telecom industry is going. Well, first of all, Mr. President, Yossi, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for the invitation. It is a big, big pleasure and it's an honor to be here and uh, contribute a little bit, despite Yossi Vardy's slightly provocative moderation style. Um, and also, every year this, every, I love you. Every year the same. Every it's year the same thing. You know, you get a briefing, and I had a very detailed and well-structured speech, and then you know the whole thing gets. Uh, no, no, don't worry. By all means. No, I did it last time. It didn't come across that well. So, so this time I try and be very brief. Um, uh, let me. Um, uh, say a few things first. First and foremost, my statistics and the numbers I'm using are not being invented on the spot. <laughs> they have been invented 10 minutes ago when I sat there and took notes. <laughs> and, uh, and also what I would like to say, and I mean it's very serious, your culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in this country is so inspiring and so impressive. You know, we are here with a number of people from our company to learn to cooperate very closely with the more companies, the better of, uh, from Israel, and wherever applicable and wherever uh, you know appropriate to copy with pride. So, Just so we're a here minute. to stay. Anybody associated with Deutsche Telekom, either work for them, supply them, buy from them, please stand up. Please stand up. Oh, that's not bad. That's a beginning. Maurice, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So. Um, I'd like to say a few things about what I consider the most, uh, the biggest um, change in life and the biggest change in productivity, efficiency and everything else, but also the biggest challenge at the same time. That's, you know, it's very obvious that our future lifestyle is more and more mobile. Our communication has already become to the largest extent mobile. Despite the very great cinemas, we still use, you know, mobile devices uh, also for HD video and the like. Um, but that, you know, 150% penetration in most markets now, and people are checking their mobile device every couple of minutes, like every five or six minutes. My personal impression is my 14-year-old daughter checks it every six seconds. But so the challenges are related to that are traffic increase, traffic increase, traffic increase. More and more video goes mobile. 
more and more uh, cloud applications go mobile and so forth. And we haven't even started the mobile internet. It has only just begun. We've scratched the surface. Machine to machine, you know, everybody knows we're talking about this since quite a while, but we expect some 40, 50 billion devices to be connected in a few years. Today we connect cars, We've, we're connecting cameras, game consoles, and everything else. We're going to connect glasses, clothes, whatever, clothing, and so forth. So, so the, the data amount in the network becomes increasingly uh, you know, huge, and the, the traffic needs to be managed much more intelligently in the future. And we also have to deploy certain technical tools in order to manage the quality of each service um, in the best possible way. So technology becomes vital. And for us network operators, since everything goes mobile, the challenge is how to manage the traffic and how to avoid traffic jam, and also how to become most efficient in order to make, continue to make money on it. And therefore, the future is, of course, all IP, the all IP-based networks. The future is software-defined networks. And, and the future is you know, head networks, uh, heterogeneous networks based on different wireless technologies which are seamlessly integrated. So the user, the customer, has no, nothing to worry how to connect, what, how to configure the device, and so forth. And, and finally, apart from all the technology stuff, do you know what, what our industry, do you think our industry so far has become customer friendly? Do you know what customer friendliness means so far? In most companies, in most countries except ours, of course, Customers have to be friendly. So we have to change that paradigm. <laughs> and we are changing that paradigm. And it's like potentially Ruth Westheimer would say, you know, tr try another position. Uh, <laughs> so we are, we're working hard on that. And what's key to it is not only create, you know, the highest performing access networks and make sure that, you know, capacity is available and each service like HD video or each service which has inelastic traffic works very well but also that customers understand what we do, that they understand you know, the pricing schemes, that they get great, great first-level support, um, that they are being as easiest as possible uh, connected to the network and authenticated. Simplicity becomes a very, very big point in, you know, regarding the zillions of different kinds of services and the complexity. Because the digital natives, that's not a problem. They understand. But there is more than just the digital natives in the world. There are probably 60 or 70 percent, at least in Western democracy, uh, the societies, of people who haven't grown up with the Internet. So we need to take them along. They and make die. Sure that they they die. Slowly they die. No, no. They become 120 like you. But, <laughs> but, but so we need to make sure that Internet is there for everyone. And simplicity is very, is very key. I think that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, uh, Rene, just to make you happy to show you how profound is your industry, can you please turn on the light? Very good. Anybody who is using a mobile phone, would you stand, please? <laughs> Anybody who is using mo three devices and more, would you stand up? Anybody who doesn't have any more landline, would you stand up? Yeah. Okay, so it's, it seems that you are in the right space, uh, Rene. Mark, salesforce.com. You took the heart of all of us, you took our Rolodex, you took our address book, which is the most valuable asset that we have, and you convinced all of us to put it in your depository. That's amazing. And we were stupid enough to do it, of course. OK, well, uh, let me begin by saying, um, first of all, to President Perez, thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today and all these great people. And um, happy birthday. Uh, I've been coming to Israel for over 30 years, and what I love about Israel is it's a country, every time you come back, it's better. It has improved. It, it improves not just through its infrastructure, it doesn't just improve through its physical beauty, uh, but it improves through the people. Every time I come to Israel, someone new has come, maybe an Aliyah, maybe another immigrant, maybe 
somebody who's moved here as part of a technology company, but the companies, the companies that are investing, the reason that Israel gets better day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, it is the people. The most innovative, creative, entrepreneurial people in the world are in this country. I used to think, was it the beautiful lakes and bays? Then I realized there's really only two significant water elements in Israel, and one of them was dead. <laughs> then I looked around, I said, well, what, what else is there here? And I said, the one country in the world, uh, God said there's no oil. Okay, what else are we gonna find? The great people. The, the human resource. This is the great natural resource. And through the great leadership of our president uh, over so many decades, the inspiration to create this country that is based on a desire to create a better world. To Ken Alum, right here, every single minute, every single day, thank you, Mr. President, for giving us this vision of the world. Now, let me just say, uh, Yossi wants me to talk about a little bit about technology, and of course I'm very interested in technology, and in this region I'm especially interested in technology, how it relates to peace, and for over 16 years I've been working on that in different uh, projects uh, with the President and with Yossi and with others, but I want to step back and just tell you, we are in the most exciting time in the technology industry ever. The most exciting, most fantastical, amazing, magical time our industry has ever experienced. We are all so fortunate to be alive right now to be able to witness this incredible renaissance. I was just in Tokyo, Japan, and I was with a great CEO. His name is Akio Toyota. He is the CEO of Toyota Motor Company. He said, you know, you look go all around the country, Mark, the, the world, tell me, what is the future of Toyota? And I said, you know, I have a hard enough time just figuring out what the future of my own company is, but if I was to look out the future of Toyota, a great auto manufacturer, I would say, well, there's two billion people on Facebook. They call them friends. Okay, Dr. Westheimer has a different view on this, but let's just say for the argument, we do call them friends. Two billion people on Facebook, Twitter, Waze, all these great social networks all over the world. You have a Toyota Corolla, it's a great car. You have a Toyota Tacoma, it's a great car. You have a Toyota Century, it's a great car. But the next great Toyota car should be called the Toyota Friend. Because it should be a car that is a cloud car. On the cloud, it is a collaborative car. It is a car that is talking to the dealer. It is talking to the factory. It is talking to the driver. It lets drivers talk to other drivers. It builds a community of drivers. And why is my car not my friend? Why is it not talking to me on the social network? I went to New York. I met with Jeff Emmelt. He's the CEO of General Electric, another great company. He said, what is the future of my company? I said, I don't know, but I was just in Japan. And I saw Toyota friend. You make these great aircraft engines. Why is my aircraft engine not my friend? They all laughed. The 40 presidents of GE. The CEO, I said, well, let me ask you something. Why is my aircraft engine not my friend? Why is my locomotive not my friend? Why is my power plant not my friend? Why is there not a connection between that aircraft engine and the network so that I can collaborate and share? And they did it. And when the 747 recently had a problem in China, the JL airline and the Gen X engine uh, had a failure, it has an API, it produces a data report on a social network, and engineers are able to collaborate to rapidly resolve the issues. And then you can say, why? I went to Amt Netherlands, Philips is a great customer of ours, ask a question, why is my CT scanner not my friend? Why am I not connected in real time on the social network with my medical information? with my education information, with everything that I do in my life. I'm on the board of Cisco Systems. John Chambers spoke here yesterday. They call it the Internet of Everything. 
It could be the Internet of Things. All I can tell you is we are at a transformational moment in our industry. And it's about seven things that are coming together, many of things that you've heard from the previous speakers and these speakers. But the companies that are successful today, the countries that are successful today, are doing seven things that you need to know about, that you need to be a master of if you want to be successful. If you want to know why Waze was just acquired for a billion dollars, it hits all seven things beautifully. And the things that are successful are these seven things. Just a minute, everybody together, one. Yes. No, scream. One, two, three. <laughs> the first thing, the most important thing we heard, of course, I'm not going to let him count it all out because it'll take me an hour to get through the whole presentation, is, of course, social networks. The fastest, most exciting part of our industry, fastest growth. But as Tim Armstrong correctly stated, not just consumer social networks, but enterprise social networks, product social networks, customer social networks, partner social networks, even traffic social networks, all types of social networks, mobile, billions of people, as so beautifully articulated on LTE this and high-speed wireless. Me. Mobile is two. Two. Just a minute. All together. And big data and analytics, number three. If you come to the San Francisco Bay Area, what you'll see is hundreds of new companies that have started focused just in one area, big data and analytics. That for many years now has been held hostage by hardware, is being unleashed by software, and we're gonna see a transformational moment in the ability for companies and organizations to get access to their information. And four, the ability to build communities rapidly. You know, we just saw a great company called uh, Unilever and they have this great product called Dove, which is soap. And they have this incredible marketing campaign for women called Real Beauty, where they made videos of women who came in to talk about their experiences with themselves. How did they see themselves? And you know what the video showed? They had a sketch artist who was a criminal a sketch artist, and the women would describe themselves, and the art, sketch artist would make a comment, and then someone else would come in who knew the woman and also say, this is how I describe the woman. And in every case, they could see that the way a woman saw themselves was different than how others saw themselves, and it was a revelation a moment. But it became a viral marketing campaign. It became a one-to-one -one marketing campaign. They were able to build community. Phenomenal opportunity today, as Maurice really well articulated in one-to-one -one marketing. And then we move into the next incredible opportunity. Five. Which, is that where we are? Yes. <laughs> which is every company, every company is becoming a software company. Every organization is becoming a software company. Toyota, GE, Philips, every organization, the government of Israel is becoming a software company. Who is not in software? I used to be excited to walk in, well, I'm the software developer. Today, everyone is in software. Who's not in software? Every company is an app company. And if you're not an app company, then you're not connecting with your customers in a new way. And that is all done on the cloud, which is number six. And that is a new way that we've been talking about now for 14 years. We started our company in 1999. The cloud, you do not have to install, upgrade, maintain your own infrastructure. And seven is not technology at all but really well articulated by the previous panel, trust. Because when your car is connected, when your CT scanner is connected, when your engine is connected, the fundamental nature of trust between you and the network, between you yourself, between you and others, is so well articulated by Dr. Ruth and by every person here subtly, trust changes. You know, it's kind of interesting. Elon Musk is a great entrepreneur in the United States. He has a new company called Tesla. And Great car, I have one, it's on the network, on and on and on. So the New York Times does a review of Tesla. Well, you're gonna drive, see if you can really make it to the charging station. They take it out, they're driving the car. Oh, we're so, Mr. Musk, you know, it didn't make it to the charging station. We are so sorry. But we had to take a picture of it on a tow truck and put it in our newspaper. Your car is not as good as you say it is. He said, really? Well, did you know it's a connected car? Did you know it's on the network? And do you know that we're recording everything that you're doing with the car? 
why are you driving it in circles in the parking lot before you took it out on the test drive? And they said, oh, did we do that? Yeah. You know, I was telling you about Philips is a great company, and I was telling you about the CT scanners. Well, they have this amazing new thing, which is the connected toothbrush. And it's Wi-Fi based and GPS located. <laughs> you brush your teeth, and it records everything you do. You talk and then to you get to your dentist. What's the first thing your dentist always asks you? Did you brush? Did you brush? Do you write? Oh, now he will say, oh yeah, I brushed, I brushed. You go, now we'll see. We will look. We'll see if you brushed. We'll see how you brushed. How often, where, when, how you hold the toothbrush. Now, it, it's a change in trust between you and your dentist, between you and your, uh, uh, your insurance company who is maintaining your car. Insurance company is going to say, let me just have access to your car information. I'll give you a better rate. And in every area of our life that becomes connected, trust will change. This is the phenomenal opportunity, and trusted relationships will also change. And these seven things together is the most transformational, most dynamic, most exciting opportunity that we could all participate in. And when you see these great companies emerge and new companies and the phenomenons, it's the companies that have all seven of these items are the ones that are rising up and ascending and I really recommend for all the great entrepreneurs that are here and people looking into the future to align around that and to create a new kind of company, which I call a customer company, a company that has a one-to-one -one relationship, exactly beautifully stated by Mr. Levy, you know, that you can connect with your customers, your employees, as stated by Mr. Armstrong, with your products, with your partners in a whole new way. This is our great new reality that we're living in today. This is our opportunity. This is our growth area. And this is the opportunity for Israel and the technology industry. Thank you again for inviting me, Yossi. Thank you very and much. And Mr. President, thank you. Yossi. Mark, you never cease to amaze us. Dr. Root, uh, what do you think as having your jet engine and toothbrush as your friends instead of your living friends? Okay, and last but not least, uh, Robert Lekaskiu, please. Well, I travel 272 days a year, and I don't want to make a friend of a 747 engine. I, uh, I'd rather make a friend of the person next to me, which is just as hard, but um, in this day and age. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I came to Israel 13 years ago, and I bought a company here that had five guys that were on Mashab Benetzion. What do you mean five guys? Five terrific guys. Five terrific guys. I don't know if any of you are in the audience, but five terrific guys. Anybody of from Human Click? Pardon? Human Click was zero. Human before. Click. Anybody from Human Click is in the audience? No. Eita, no, they didn't come. That today, so if you look at the journey, today we have 400 employees here in Israel. It's about half my company is here in Israel. And, and when I came here, when I came here, I, I never had a connection with this country. I'm uh, Italian. I have an Italian mother, obviously. That's like a Jewish mother. Uh, what is the difference between Italian mother and Jewish mother, Robert? Can I tell the joke? Yeah, you should tell. So when you're sitting there and you're not eating your meal as a child, an Italian mother comes up to you and says, if you don't eat your meal, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and a Jewish mother comes up and says, if you don't eat the meal, I'm going to kill myself. That's, that's Yossi's, Yossi's joke. So um, when I look at my journey here, and we've bought five companies so far, and, and this country is, is a very special place for myself personally, and I've gotten to know the culture. And today we even have Palestinians. We have five Palestinians in Ramallah as employees. Um, we've get, we're with uh, President Perez. We've hired uh, Arab Israelis. We've got about seven Arab Israelis in our company. Uh, one of the first women technologists, Arab Israelis in our, co in our company. And now we're hiring Orthodox. And what Orthodox. is your recent shtick, uh, Robert? No. What was it? No, no. What, what is the last thing you are doing? Oh, we just... So after all that, by the way, Yossi's the one who's been pushing me to hire all these people. And then he said, now that you've hired Arab Israelis and Palestinians, my wife's working on a program for Orthodox women. Can you hire them? So we hired five Orthodox women now. So... 
You know, it's just going to keep going. Now his wife came up to me the other day and said, can you hire Orthodox men? I don't know where the end of all this is, to be honest. Um, but what I can say is that I think Israel's at an interesting inflection point. Uh, we talk about the startup nation here. And, um, and I've been giving a lot of speeches lately. I think Israel has to go beyond the startup nation mentality. Just a statistic, for every one millionaire that's made in Israel, there's a thousand people who live below the poverty line. And I really feel that the opportunity is, is taking a different view of being a startup. A startup, and I know, because I started my company 18 years, I slept on a couch, I've, I've done the hard work, but it's all about survival. And I think Israel is sometimes focused too much on survival and has so many great things, as Mark said. The people here are phenomenal. You're the smartest technologist in the world. Um, there's only two places to do technology. It's here in Silicon Valley. And I really feel that the opportunity now is to create global, truly a global mindset. And when we look at countries like Singapore, or the other day I was, I was speaking at an Israeli conference in California, somebody came up to me and said, what about Korea? We have an enemy on the border. And look what we've done. We've created global companies. And I think if Israel is truly gonna make the next leap, I think the opportunity is creating a global uh, mindset. And that's thinking that today, the number one competitors and I think enemies to Israel is, is really other countries like Brazil and China who want me to leave. You know, they, they say, Rob, you're here with 400 people, come to Brazil, it's cheaper. And we don't have political issues like you have here, although we can see the, the protests everywhere, even in, in Brazil. But I think the opportunity today for everyone here, and I, especially the entrepreneurs, is taking a different mindset and, and maybe going the distance and trying to build big companies and, uh, and trying to, to think a little differently. So I'm, I'm proud to be here, but I, I challenge everyone who's building companies today to take a different mindset and go the distance and try to build something big. Try to build something with 10,000 employees here, okay? So, so that's my, my speech about Israel. Um, to, to continue with that about, I think it's about, um, in my company, we, we work with the biggest companies in the world are providing technology for their contact centers to chat with their customers, and we've got 9,000 customers. So I'm seeing something kind of cool. I was with one of the biggest banks in the United States, and the person who runs the contact center, and this person turned to me and said, I hope Twitter goes away. I can't wait till Twitter goes away. I wish Facebook would disappear. I'm sick and tired of having to manage customers that are, are not coming to me that are saying bad things about my brand. So I thought about, uh, that, was, that was a US person. That was a perspective. So I think the relationships, and there is a shifting mindset about how do we connect with our customers, but there still can be an old mindset. Then I'm in the UK, and I met with a guy who runs the contact center, one of the biggest um, telcos there, and he said, we've got 10,000 agents doing voice, 0800 numbers. My vision is to get rid of all of those agents and I want our customers connected with each other. I want them chatting, I want them messaging. I don't want to have a traditional contact center. I want to rip it down. And in, if I go over to Australia, there's a bank there that just recently got rid of their contact center and they moved all the connection back off the website. So when you call or chat off the website, you chat with somebody in a branch, in a local branch. And then there's another bank there that 40% of their leads, 40% of their new customers comes through social. So I think today there's such an imbalance, there's such a, it's not consistent around the world. And we talk about being more connected with our customers, but I think the greatest challenge for businesses is to think a little bit differently. How do we embrace these technologies and do that? I know Mark's obviously working on that too. So I think, when I think about community and connection, I think being meaningfully connected to people, I think that's what will make our world a better place with our customers, but also obviously in places like this with our neighbors. So that's my, um, my world and my thinking. Thank you. So you have now 400 employees in Israel. Yep. How many in the States? We have at headquarters only about 125 in New York. So it's about, about two, 300 in the United States. And then the rest are in, uh, in Europe and Asia. Somebody told me recently that Israel has to reach a size of 10,000 employees to a company. When do you think you are going to reach this number? It's my goal. You know, I, I, uh, I remember it was only six years ago when we hired a, a guy, Eli Campo, who's in the audience, and, and he was our GM, and we only Eli, had six Eli, stand up. Eli is the general manager of LifePerson in Israel and drive the growth. 
and I, I remember we only had 60 employees six years ago, and I remember I said, Ellie, one day we're going to have a, our name on a building here in Renana, and we looked at each other, yeah, and today we have, you know, four or five floors in our name, and, and I'd like to be one of the companies that actually tries to push it here and try to build a truly global business that's global-centric from Israel, that center is from Israel. So that's, that's my goal. Now, Robert, let, let me, let's, be, let's be open. When you made your first investment uh, in Israel, what was the price of your stock? Uh, a dollar. A dollar. And how much it is now? About $10. $10. That's not bad. And this is because of your growth in Israel, right? Say it's yes. Why do you mind? Yes, everything's because of Israel. <laughs> it's because, actually, of you. Thank you, Yossi. Robert has done a phenomenal uh, job in Israel. Whaley, uh, you have 1,200 uh, employees in Israel, right? Yes. Yes, Intel has 8,700. How do you let them uh, be bigger than you? Well, you know, hey, being second is not bad, right? It's not about how many people, how, you know, the impact we're making. So I look at, well, before we started this session and we got together, the, the panelists, and uh, Yossi said, you have to do two things, comedy and conflict, right? So I, I actually don't, have a don't little- Don't give them I, all my secrets. Uh, so I have a little conflict for the uh, comments that the Morris, uh, Morris made it was a collaboration only, mo no cooperation. So for me, I actually, uh, embracing cooperation as well, besides collaboration. So even though Intel is number one in Israel, we're the second, the little second, like as uh, Yossi described, but I, co you know, doing cooperation with Intel. And I believe um, as we all talk about the way we need to operate uh, technology and to support the industries, to empower the lifestyle of digital, connected everywhere, and even competitions need to collaborate. So that's translating to cooperation. So we have done a number of uh, uh, cooperations with Intel, for example, deployment of gigabit ethernet, and um, you know, I partner with Intel to push the technology faster by at least a couple years. I'm very proud of this, and we still continue to uh, collaborate and uh, after 10 years of the partnership, so that's a, a cooperation. So, my friend, thank you for your earlier comments. Um, and then, you, uh, if if you look at uh, uh, the overall, the requirement, and I like to add. Actually, I have a number eight. Can I attach a number eight to uh, Mark's uh, seven? Because you know, for Chinese, number eight is a lucky number. I like to bring a lot of luck to Israel. So number eight is if you think about the way we develop technology, what the end result we see, the connected lifestyle, I use the uh, term called smart furnishing, smart dressing, because technology is embedded in our lifestyle. And smart furnishing at home, work, public place, as we move around, the, all the live contents, video, streaming is coming from any size of pizza dough. It's going to be your countertop. It's going to be your big wall. And in the future, no longer just a so-called a standalone TV. You go to Costco, buy certain size TV. It's about make to fit. Very important. It's a make to fit. That's why I use the analogy pizza dough, because you assemble whatever topping, whatever contents you like to see real time. So this type of uh, the cloud infrastructure through the pipe and endpoints is your countertop, is your a, a light switch at home, it's your ceiling, it's your wall, uh, you get into the car, that's like a, your extension core, continue to streaming contents, so anywhere, anytime. Thank you very much. By the way, I just oh, realized... Oh, I forgot one more thing. Uh, Please, speaking, number nine. Any comments about... Number nine is a very lucky oh, number. Oh, not number nine. It's, it's the uh, uh, comments about Jewish mother and Italian mother and 
Chinese mother. Well, for Chinese mother, when my children are not eating, and I feed them, okay. That's very good. You know, we, when we were kids and we didn't finish the, the, to eat, our parents, what our parents told us? That we have to finish, why? Because in China there are a lot of kids. I didn't know what is the relation, but I look like this because in China there are a lot of kids and my... Well, oh, no, no, no. Actually, it's very good because for Chinese tradition and parents, grandparents, if you have a more feel, you know, I call it very healthy looking, you know, the Buddha, the Buddha. Buddha. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's what it is. Yes, yes. It's actually very good, yeah. Why you point on me and not on Mark? He is also a Buddha. We cut the Yossi lucky, and I lucky have face. that in common, but also I have to just say, do you know the difference between a, a Jewish mother and a pit bull? Uh, if you don't know this, a pit bull eventually lets go. Oh. Hey, we, we caught the butterfly. Mark, Mark, I saw you, I swear that I saw you talking this morning to a wall, right? The wall is your friend, why did you talk to the wall? The wall is my friend. It's another connection, that's another seminar. It's uh, next door and uh, we have different clothing for that one. Okay, and our last com commentor, commentator for this panel is again Rene Oberman who want to make a comment and I want to ask him as I like to ask him every time because I love to hear the answer. What are you doing in the University of Bathsheba, in the Ben-Gurion University? Oh, we just um, cooperate there with uh, researchers, students, uh, professors, and so forth on key topics such as network security and uh, big data analytics, uh, just to put two key items. How uh, many people? Uh, altogether about 100. This is Ismail Marimon, who is the chairman of the conference, and he makes signals that Please we thank Yossi Hardy. Please thank Yossi. Rene. All right, we, I think we heard a lot about all the great application services, lifestyle, and so forth. All of this does require ultra-high performant, uh, mostly wireless access networks. And uh, I, I, just, I, I don't want to paint a black picture here, but I would like to point out a few challenges because we need to overcome them. And the, the biggest one is radio spectrum. Not sure whether you're familiar with that problem, but, but we are lacking sufficient radio spectrum in order to build, you know, in the low band, high band, and ultra high band eventually, in order to build enough capacity and speed and performance uh, to enable all these great services. Not now, but it's, you know, we will have a thousand times the traffic of today, potentially in eight to 10 years. And that could mean we're running into traffic jams. For all of you who travel to New York regularly and who are trying to make use of their smartphone, their tablet devices in Manhattan, you will have experience. Unless you're on T-Mobile, you will have experienced some traffic jams. <laughs> we do have capacity, by the way, so it's not too late to change. So, um, but what I would like to point out is we do need the radio spectrum, and we do need more acceptance and more support for building a much denser network. So far, the network concept has been outside in, so what it means is you build a lot of radio towers, or small ones, big ones, more or less you know, where nobody is, is, uh, is uh, you know, where, where people are not bothered by them, but we have to build more sites. They're very micro sites, small sites, uh, inside the buildings in order to create the capacity. So we need more radio spectrum, and we need to cover uh, more inside places, uh, because people are mostly using their mobile devices and consume, for instance, HD video stuff and so forth inside buildings where they're quasi-stationary. And that's, that does require support from the political side. It does take regulatory action. It does require, you know, government support and from all of us as a community. And as far as I go, in my mobile life over the last 20 years, I've experienced a lot of issues with regards to building sites, you know, problems, zoning, and, and, and a lot of myth about the potential uh, physical damage, sorry, the health damage. So this is something we need to overcome. Otherwise, all the great stuff we heard about is kind of hampered, is not going to happen. So please support this radio spectrum, radio spectrum, radio spectrum. Uh, 
hopefully invest into networks because networks are a great business if it's done well. Um, and then make sure that no problems with building sites. Thank you. Thank you. Before we close, Mark, we didn't, we didn't introduce your people in the ground, so we have Nathan Gavish. Nathan, would you please stand? Anybody else associated with... This is Nathan with... Gavish, the head of or Salesforce Israel. Anybody else uh, associated with Salesforce? Anybody who uses Salesforce or is Anybody? part of Salesforce.com? Stand up if you're a Salesforce Any, lover. Anybody hates Salesforce, stay sitting. Uh, anybody who is interested in Israeli high-tech and creativity culture is invited to a panel we have at 4.30 with Israeli makers. This was a shameless uh, promotion. I would like to thank on behalf of all the audience our seven great friends of Israel, the three former one and the four current one, Robert Lekaskio, Mark Benioff, Wayley Dai and Rene Obermann, thank you very much and see you next year.